You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Sustainability Regionalization Stakeholders Visioning Community rights Biodiversity, core wilderness preserves, biosphere reserves, human settlements. Oh, this is the lovely, wonderful, swaddling language of the United Nations and their Agenda 21. So some of you may have come across this type of language before, ladies and gentlemen, when looking into Agenda 21 and the type of language that it uses to ingratiate itself in various local communities. But it is... If the soft and fuzzy and cuddly rhetoric belies a very nasty reality underneath. And tonight I'm hoping to go over this sustainable sustainable development agenda 21 uh, agenda that's unfolding and how it's operating, who's behind it, and what the guiding ideology behind it is. But unfortunately, our guest for this evening, Rosa Corey, is not yet online, so I haven't been able to get in touch with her. I am hoping we'll be able to get her up soon enough. But for those of you who are unfamiliar with Rosa Corey, you can find out more about her work at the Post Sustainability Institute, and that's postsustainabilityinstitute.org. She's also the author of Behind the Green Mask, UN Agenda 21, which is widely available online. Many of her talks and, uh, and speeches, etc. are also available online for those of you who, out there who want to, to find out more. And uh, tonight we're going to be talking about this unfolding agenda and what's behind it, who's behind it, where it's going, and how it's going to get us there. But uh, just before we get into that, perhaps we should find out a little bit more about sustainability and how it's sold to the public. So on DemocratsAgainstUNAgenda21.com, we have uh, this from Rosa, uh, sorry, sorry, Rosa Corey's website, but it's actually by Henry Lamb. And this is from an article that was first published on December 1st of 2005. It says, quote, As the sustainable development movement continues to gain momentum, it is worthwhile to step back and take a long look at the big picture, painted with a broad brush to reveal what the United States might look like as the movement's vision is more fully implemented over the next 50 years or so. The picture painted here is based on official documents published by several government agencies and non-government organizations during the last decade. These documents were rarely reported in the news, and average working people have no idea what sustainable development really means, and even less knowledge of what is in store for the future. If the vision of sustainable development continues to unfold as it has in the last decade, life in the United States will be quite different in the future. Half the land area of the entire country will be designated wilderness area where only wildlife managers and researchers will be allowed. These areas will be interconnected by corridors of wilderness to allow migration of wildlife without interference by human activity. Wolves will be as plentiful in Virginia and Pennsylvania as they are now in Idaho and Montana. Panthers and alligators will roam freely from the Everglades to the Oaken... Okefenokee, excuse my pronunciation, and beyond. Surrounding these wilderness areas and corridors, designated buffer zones will be managed for conservation objectives. The primary objective is restoration and rehabilitation. Rehabilitation involves the repair of damaged ecosystems, while restoration usually involves the reconstruction of natural or semi-natural ecosystems. As areas are restored and rehabilitated, they are added to the wilderness designation, and the buffer zone is extended outward. Buffer zones are surrounded by what is called zones of cooperation. This is where people live in sustainable communities. Sustainable communities are defined by strict urban growth boundaries. Land outside the growth boundaries will be managed by government agencies which grant permits for activities deemed to be essential and sustainable. That's right, friends, the vision of the future under Agenda 21 is a vision of a complete totalitarian society micromanaged down to the absolutely smallest level by bureaucrats in the United Nations who have absolutely no accountability to you, me, or anyone else. And this is the nightmare vision of a society that's coming on to us under the guise of sustainability and all of this fun, fluffy, cuddly rhetoric. We're going to be back with Rosa Corey to break that down right after these messages.
If you love your uncle All right, friends, welcome back to the broadcast. Welcome back to Corbett Report Radio. I'm your host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, and tonight we have on the line as our special guest, Rosa Corey of the Post Sustainability Institute. She's also at Democrats Against UN Agenda 21.com. Of course, that will be linked up in the show notes for tonight's episode in case you miss it. But Rosa Corey, author of uh, uh, Behind the Green Mask and talking about the UN Agenda 21 and what is really behind it. Rosa Corey, it's great to have you on the program. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks so much, James. Well, perhaps we can start off for the benefit of the listeners out there who are encountering you for the first time or are unfamiliar with your work. Let's just hear a little bit about yourself and how you got interested in researching UN Agenda 21. Well, um, I'm a professional appraiser, a commercial appraiser. I was a district branch chief for the California Department of Transportation for about 30 years and an expert witness testifying in land use and land value. And uh, about 10 or so years ago, I found that it was pretty difficult to determine what property was worth because people were being restricted in what they could do with their property. And around that same time, I was elected to an oversight committee on a redevelopment project, a huge project, and I researched it and found that it was fraudulent. So uh, we sued to stop that, and while doing the research uh, to find out what was behind that redevelopment project, I found United Nations Agenda 21 Sustainable Development. Well, let's talk about your book and how that came together and the type of research that you've done over the uh, the pre- preceding years into this agenda. The book is, um, basically, I wrote the book because I am traveling all over the United States and I just simply wasn't able to go everywhere. And I had the information and was able to put it together in a way that's very clear and understandable and it's a quick, short read. And, uh, and in that way, I was able to reach a lot more people because uh, United Nations Agenda 21 Sustainable Development is a global plan, but it's implemented locally. So this is really important because it, it doesn't come called Agenda 21. So you have to know what it looks like in your town to be able to recognize it. Well, that's right. In fact, every time we have someone on to talk about Agenda 21, it's uh, everyone has their own way of summing up what that is and, and how it's unfolding. So, so what's your take on what is United Nations Agenda 21? Agenda 21 is the action plan. It's the blueprint to inventory and control all land, all water, all plants, all minerals, all animals, all construction, all means of production, all information, all energy, all education, and all human beings in the world. That's it. It's totally comprehensive. It's so comprehensive. It goes into so many different aspects of everyone's everyday life that it's staggering to think that so few people actually know, have even heard of this Agenda 21, let alone know what it is. How can it function so that it maintains that level of secrecy while being completely out in the open? Yeah, it's brilliant. It's a stealth plan and it's operating in plain sight. And that is because it's called by so many different names. Uh, You'll see it in your town as a regional plan, generally as uh, one Bay Area or Vision 2025 or Our Future 2050, something like that. Uh, Because what it is, uh, the plan was signed onto, it was an actual United Nations agreement signed onto in 1992 by our president, George H.W. Bush, along with 178 other national leaders. And you're going to hear that it's an old, dusty plan, that it has, it's not binding, that it has no impact on you. That's a lie. Uh, the truth is that it was uh, brought back to the United States through the President's Council on Sustainable Development back in 1993. And all federal agencies changed their policies to conform with United Nations Agenda 21 on Sustainable Development. That's right. Well, let's let's go back to some of the beginnings of this, because as you indicate, it was uh, first signed uh, as an agreement in 1992 at the Rio Earth Summit, but it has its roots in policies that go back as at least to the 1970s. So let's talk a little bit about the history of these ideas of sustainable development and how they came together. Yeah, it's great. You know, it's the kind of thing that you could, you think to yourself, well, how could I be against sustainability? It just sounds so great. I mean, what do you, you know, who wants to be unsustainable? 
Um, and of course, that term, sustainable development, is a term that comes right out of the United Nations, 1987, the Bretland Commission, World Commission on Environment and Development, and they wrote a, a book called Our Common Future, and in that, the term sustainable development was first, uh, you know, first coined, you know, formally given a definition, and that is um, de a development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. Sounds great, right? But uh, this has its roots in um, prior meetings of the United Nations in 1972 and then again in 1976, the uh, Habitat 1 and 2 determined that um, land, privately owned land, is actually a threat to the equity, social equity of people on the planet. And this is a very vital part of the United Nations Agenda 21 because it actually is an attack on private property ownership. And also, you have to remember that we ourselves are our own most important private property. And this plan actually enables uh, domestic surveillance, the National Defense Authorization Act, drones, and control of all of our activities on the planet. I think there must be a variety of reasons for why this is being pushed um, by the people that it is. But I guess if there is a guiding ideology behind this, I've heard it cited before that communitarianism might be that uh, that ideology that provides the framework for this agenda. So what what is communitarianism and how does that play into this agenda? Communitarianism says that the it's an ideology, it's a political and social philosophy. And it says that the uh, the rights of the individual need to be balanced with the rights of the community. And, you know, if you're an American or many, you know, in many free countries, the individual's rights are guaranteed. Our rights are guaranteed to us by our constitution, cannot be taken away by, uh, you know, by any uh, government. And we're born with them, right? But if you balance the rights of the individual with the rights of the community, those community rights are not delineated. They can change at any time. They are, uh, you know, depending on who the ruler or uh, government is. And they always have greater weight than the weight of the individual. That means that you're always going to see that the individual's rights are a threat to the community. And in this case, we're talking about the global community. Well, that, that's right. And it does kind of flip the idea of rights on its head, the rights that are enshrined for, enshrined, for example, in the Bill of Rights, or even the ones that they pay lip service to in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights are all guarantees of individual rights and liberties. But somehow now we're expected to take on board the idea that there are communal rights that somehow supersede those of the individual. So where does this idea come from? And who are the types of people who are pushing this? Well, this is an ideology that, you know, I mean, you can go back to the Fabian socialists in the 1800s, you know, if you want to, if you're, you know, if you're interested in doing, uh, you know, sort of a theoretical search on the development of this plan, but it goes back further. Obviously, it goes back to any ideology that, uh, that instates a dictatorship or an oligarchy. But in our case, because we, you know, we are a free nation, uh, it needs to have the trappings of, uh, a socially acceptable um, philosophy, and that's where communitarianism comes in, because what we're talking about here is the three E's, environment, economy, and equity, social equity. That's, you know, when you see those three circles, the image of United Nations Agenda 21, it looks like a Venn diagram, you know, and where ec economy, ecology, and social equity come together, that's, uh, you know, sustainable development, that's sustainable but equity is a very vital part of this because this is the illusion is that you're going to have, you know, a balanced world where everyone is going to, you know, no one's going to have too much. Everyone, you know, the super wealthy 1% is going to go away and, you know, the poor will all have plenty of food and water and everything else that they need. Um, and, but the concept, you know, that's sort of the overarching concept. That's the green mask, as I call it. That's one of the reasons I call my book Behind the Green Mask, because in fact, what this what this does is it enables a uh, total takeover of our great our resources, both natural and human, by those who want to totally control the earth. 
Well, let's talk about some of those people who want to totally control the Earth and uh, some of the people who have been instrumental in this agenda. Of course, uh, people like Morris Strong were instrumental in the 1992 Rio Earth Summit. Um, who are some of the figures who have been spearheading this Agenda 21 uh, agenda? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, obviously, we're going to have the ultra wealthy and those who, uh, you know, through uh, hereditary ownership of, of property or a huge amount of the world, uh, like, you know, the, the ruling uh, royalty classes, uh, particularly the, the English who own a huge amount of the world. Uh, the, um, the Catholic Church owns a tremendous amount of the world, uh, the Vatican. But, uh, you know, I think and obviously, we're talking about Maurice Strong. He's extremely wealthy. He owns uh, one of the largest aquifers in the uh, North American continent underneath the Baca, which is uh, below the Sangre de Cristo Mountains in Colorado. Um, what we're, you know, obviously, we're seeing uh, these are enormously wealthy people who are not satisfied with just personal wealth. They want to control all assets and, uh, and all natural resources. So we're talking about. Uh, land, we're talking about oil and gas, timber, uh, water is a very vital part of this, controlling all water and owning all of those resources. So things that are now owned in the, you know, uh, by your government, by, you know, that are controlled by your local government, uh, are going to be privatized. And this is what, uh, you know, people don't recognize this when they talk about, um, you know, for instance, uh, how certain governments or certain individuals have their best interests and are talking about, you know, like, for instance, Bill Gates, you know, wanting to vaccinate, uh, you know, the poor of the world. Exactly Things right. Like okay, we're going to have to take a break. We'll come back. We're talking once again to Rosa Corey, Democrats Against UNAgenda21.com. The Corbett Report is brought to you by The Corbett Report subscriber. A weekly newsletter featuring James Corbett's International Forecaster Editorial, recommended reading and viewing, discounts on Corbett Report DVDs, and once a month, a subscriber-only video. Sign up today to start receiving your copy at corbettreport.com support. Welcome back to Corbett Report Radio. Once again, I'm your host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, and tonight we're talking to Rosa Corey, the author of Behind the Green Mask, talking about UN Agenda 21 and the sustainable development agenda that is unfortunately unfolding before our very eyes. Let's start talking about some positive things and things that people can do against this agenda. But before we get into that, we have a caller on the line, and we have Lark in Texas. Lark, thank you for joining us on the line again tonight. Hello, Lark. Are you there? Speak to me, Lark. All right. Well, we'll come back to Lark. <laughs> but Rosa, first, before we get to the uh, the callers, let's let's talk about the, uh, the the process that we were talking about before the break. We were talking about how people are distracted from this agenda by uh, not participating in local politics. And that is exactly how it, this agenda is moving forward. So let's talk about some of the solutions to what we see coming forth for the people who are aware of what's happening. What is it that they can be doing at their local level to help combat this? Well, I think um, it's really important to understand how you're being manipulated locally uh, so that when you are, you know, when you see it, you understand that it's happening. And uh, I spend quite a bit of time in my book talking about how to anti-Delphi government meetings. Um, Delphi, the Delphi method is a uh, Delphi technique. It was, was developed by the Rand Corporation in uh, post-World War II in the Cold War. And it is being used to, uh, the, the reason that it was developed was, uh, was to bring groups of people to a predetermined outcome while giving them the idea, the, the, uh, you know, the illusion that they actually had a say and that they had a, you know, that they were actually crafting the outcome themselves. So this is, uh, this is a, actually a, a, a management organizational technique that's being used right now in every large government meeting where you are invited to come and give your opinion on a plan. Usually these are the regional plans or the a general plan or a master plan for your local town. And, uh, of course, you know, when you show up there and, you know, they have the little, the screen show, you know, and they have, you know, you color with your crayon and put your little gold stars on the map and show where you want to see smart growth, high density development. Um, really, the plan is all designed before you walk in the room. 
In fact, the plan, you know, of course, as I said, it's the same plan all across the world. So uh, you need to know how to anti-Delphi because what they're doing there is they're, they're doing two things. They're propagandizing you, and they're also using social pressure, which is part of communitarianism, to make it so that you, if, if, even if you don't agree with the plan, you will be too, um, your, act, your nerves won't be able to handle standing up and saying that you don't agree with it because there's all that social pressure to, uh, to keep you quiet, you know, and so everyone goes along with it. So what we uh, talk about, what I talk about in the book, and what we have, uh, you know, we've got videos online to show you what happens when we go in an anti-Delphi meeting. You really need to make it clear that those plans are not your plan, that you are being manipulated, and you have to take these meetings down correctly, or you're just going to end up looking like, um, uh, you know, someone who's a rabble rouser, who's uh, trying to, you know, keep all these good people from being able to express this wonderful plan to all your, you know, local citizenry. So uh, it's very important to understand that um, this is uh, this is a mind control technique, and this is there's almost a cult element to the to this plan in its entirety. And they use professional organizations like the American Planning Association, like the National Association of Counties like the League of Cities, uh, the uh, League of Women Voters, the uh, many, many non-governmental organizations are part of this plan because they are empowered by United Nations Agenda 21. Exactly right. Well, it paints, paints a bleak picture, but at least there is the hope that people can start to get involved. On that note, we have Lark in Texas back on line. Lark, thanks for joining us on the conversation. Well, thank you, James. I apologize. You were unable to hear me before. I can't imagine where the technical snafu arose. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Oh, very good. Um, Rosa, I'm so glad you said mind control. It's such a pivotal uh, term of art that needs to be understood because you mentioned earlier, you too, James, about how it is that this is being, uh, this agenda is being introduced to the uh, through the general population by empowering some and uh, painting it as a uh, as a kind of a universal buy-in. And so, what I wanted to bring to your attention, invite your comment, is I've been doing some research recently into uh, uh, historical roots and development of uh, altruism. We're talking about the at the university academia level. And it's tie-in with what is known as the tikkun olam, which is a uh, Jewish concept uh, of, uh, uh, <clears throat> which means repair of the world. And this is where I have discovered the language and how it's being manipulated so that people are led to believe that this is such a wonderful thing and how they're deceived. Because in, in, an example of that is tonight I was doing some research on something called SoilTrust.com. SoilTrust.com. And it sounds like a wonderful thing. And I looked at the people behind its management, the board of directors, how these things are funded. A similar program is something called uh, Community Supported Agriculture. Right. But within all segments of society, whether it's uh, industry or law or academia, medicine, science. I'm seeing how this language is manipulated, and the only people that are able to get funding for anything that they want to do have to buy into this kind of coded language in order to receive support. Right. Any it's comments? Like, it's displaying the gang symbols in order to get the, the gang funding. I think that's uh, that exactly. must be part of it. Well, Rosa, your thoughts on that? Well, Takuna Lam is, uh, you know, it's, it's it's about uh, it's about doing for the world. Um, uh, what you're talking about with altruism is uh, is a is something that actually um, was is wrongly associated with Christianity. Uh, it's the theory uh, by uh, Auguste Comte that uh, says that you know in fact you're supposed to um, uh, do for others. And so what this ends up looking like really is uh, communism. And uh, because and and I'm not now we're not talking about communism here we're talking about communitarianism and this is something different but what we're looking at is uh, with social equity that it's you know this is put they're using uh, guilt 
And they're saying that basically that those of us in the developed world have too much. This is what sustainable development is. What is considered to be unsustainable is single family residences, private vehicles, um, meat eating, uh, appliances, air conditioning. And so uh, this is everything that you're accustomed to living with in the developed world and what you wish to have, at, you know, if you're aspiring to the middle class, at least. Um, you know, this is considered to be a source of guilt. And so what we're, what we're dealing with here is a number of, of different uh, uh, philosophies that come together that all justify basically taking away your right to be, your, li your livelihood and your right to be independent. And to give you the sense that you need to redefine progress and redefine the way that you relate to the world because you need to be ashamed that you are associated with anything that would exploit the natural resources. You see, this concept says that the resources of the world are finite. So there's no such thing as renewable resources like water, or you know, because you, and so you then have to be charged the real cost of water. And this is another way we are being impoverished by the implementation of this plan. All right, Lark, thank you for that call. Uh, let's move along. We also have William in Oregon on the line. So, William, thank you for your call tonight. What's on your mind? Well, thank you. I was just following Rosa's uh, comments on this and very uh, articulate and well-spoken. Uh, uh, in looking at frameworks, uh, we deal with the frameworks uh, pertaining to detection, analysis, and then what comes out of this. The... Uh, the capstone doctrine, as it's known, is a UN doctrine, also has a longer history. And what is coming out of that is international innovative law, uh, consensus reality, and down down into the uh, abolition of the individual uh, property rights uh, replaced by a uh, collective. Mm -hmm. The doctrine that is most articulated uh, that we have tracked and uh, spent many years in deep field audits on is collaborative governance. Collaborative governance is what uh, Rosa is talking about in terms of doctrine. The theories and the applications uh, may be abstracted as communitarian law and so forth, but the actual doctrine specifying the Delphi technique, which is basically uh, on the same page, go along with or else, uh, sets up isolation, alienation, and termination of any critical or dissenting opinion. Mm -hmm. The solutions that we've looked at that go in, uh, that actually go into this, obviously, are detection. The Achilles heels of the collaborative uh, movement, and it is called the collaborative movement, is the non-disclosure aspect of their contracting processes. In other words, you have a lot of... Uh, uh, so-called green enviro packs, political action committees that are safeguarded by a, uh, a contracting secrecy arrangement. They call it spirit of confidentiality. So we've tracked this to the extent of a 706-page report about all of the particulars and how this fits in and integrates to larger uh, plans, not conspiracy, actual plans, of the capstone doctrine. There's no question that there is a religious uh, grounding in these documents, whether it's a left certification scheme uh, for green, uh, they believe. They believe in the precautionary principle, which right. means you don't have any data to make a decision from. All and right, let's, let's they, get Rosa's comments on this. So your take on this collaborative yeah, 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 governance I idea, Rosa. Because I really appreciate hers. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. It was excellent. Um, uh, let me just, there's a lot there. And of course, I, I do actually go into all of this in my book. Um, one thing, I, I was in a, an international conference uh, this past June, and uh, one of the other speakers was President Vaclav Klaus of the Czech Republic. And what he said was that, of course, the Czech, uh, Czech Republic, the Czechs, you know, did everything that they could to get out from under the Soviet Union. They emerged free and, uh, against his wishes, joined the EU, the European Union. And he said, of course, now they're under the, uh, the control of, uh, of Brussels. And what we're talking about, uh, of course, you have, uh, you know, 
non-governmental organizations are vital to this plan because they are actually, this is the way the circle goes around, is that they influence government, government funds them, they are also funded and influenced by corporations. And uh, they make contractual agreements, so they have interwoven systems with local governments. And ultimately what we're talking about is empowering local government and then moving that uh, emp empowerment into a regional cycle. So um, this is, this is uh, you know, I'd like to get into ICLE, International Council on Local Environmental Initiatives, because this is uh, sort of a springboard for it. But, of course, the precautionary principle, uh, you know, is a vital part of this because it says that basically you're guilty until proven innocent, that um, if there's any suspicion of an action being taken that would damage in some way human beings or the environment, that in, in the absence of scientific consensus that it is, in fact, harmful, you would have to prove that it's not harmful. So this, this is a, a, a sort of a catch-22 situation that, that destroys a lot of small business. It is, it is, this plan is a corporate plan. It's a global corporatocracy. It is a totalitarian plan. It is designed to destroy all small independence and local control. Exactly right. Well, William Lark, thank you for your calls. Thank you for your comments. Um, Rosa, you, you bring up the specter of ICLE. Let's start talking about what that is and how that plays mm -hmm. into this. Yeah, ICLE is called, uh, well, what it is, uh, is I-C-L-E-I, -E those are letters, and they stand for International Council on Local Environmental Initiatives. It is an international group headquartered in Bonn, Germany. It was created in 1990 prior to, um, prior to the signing of United Nations Agenda 21. And in fact, they wrote uh, at least one chapter, Chapter 28 on non-governmental organizations in Agenda 21. And ICLE is, a, is actually was created to implement Agenda 21 throughout the world. That is the, its purpose. So uh, what they do is they, um, they concentrate power in cities because, see, it's local environmental initiatives. So they have city memberships. And these are cities all over the world. They have something like 7,800 city members. And we're talking about the majority of the world is in an ICLE city. Most people have no idea that their cities are members of, these, of this uh, organization. And uh, what it does is it gives the illusion of local control, but it circumvents requirements for ratification of international treaties. Because, for instance, the United States did not sign the Kyoto Treaty, but 1,055 United States mayors did actually uh, agree to implement Kyoto in the United States, and that is happening right now. So um, what it does is it helps to break jurisdictional boundaries. And that is a vital part of this plan because you can't actually implement uh, global governance without destroying local uh, the locally uh, constructed governmental controls. So um, ultimately, this facilitates global governance by invalidating individual cities, counties, states, and nations. And as I said, they're contract with contractual agreements and interwoven systems. Well, I want to to uh, start focusing on some of the things that, that people have already done to try to combat this agenda. Surely there must be examples of people standing up to this. Uh, can you speak from your own experience about some positive examples of what people are doing to, to combat this? Yes, I'm so thrilled to be able to say that this is truly a worldwide, non uh, nonpartisan, grassroots movement fighting it. Uh, and my, of course, my slogan, if you will, is... Uh, uh, awareness is the first step in the resistance. So we we are really starting at square one and trying to bring the uh, bring awareness of what's going on to people. They know something's wrong, but they don't know uh, quite how all of these things come together. Uh, and so this is part of what we're all engaged in doing now. You're part of it. You're the resistance. And, uh, and so what what we've seen, of course, in the United States is um, recently the uh, Republican National uh, Committee um, has actually has uh, has signed onto uh, an agreement saying that they would, in fact, 
repudiate Agenda 21 and ICLEI in the United States. A very but, important step. We're coming up against the break. Let's talk okay. a little bit more about that after this break. Once again, talking to Rosa Corey, her book, Behind the Green Mask. I hope you'll pick it up and take a look at it. We'll be back right after these messages. All right, friends, welcome back to Corbett Report Radio. Here we are in the final few minutes of tonight's conversation with Rosa Corey. Once again, her website is democratsagainstunagenda21.com. And you can go there to buy her book, Behind the Green Mask, UN Agenda 21, and see um, m- much more of the, the articles and videos and other materials that you can find there ab- about this agenda, how it's unfolding, and what you can do ab- about it. And on that note, just before the break, we were talking about some of the positive developments that are coming across uh, all around the globe in resistance to this unfolding agenda, including even the RNC d- adopting a platform against UN Agenda 21. But I have the feeling there was a big butt coming at the end of that statement. So, Rosa, let's uh, let's pick up from there and see see what the catch is on that. Yeah, unfortunately, well, you know, um, obviously, I, I or maybe not obviously, I, I happen to be a liberal. Um, I'm not a Republican, uh, and uh, and you know, which is interesting because so many people think that uh, the only people who are speaking out about United Nations Agenda 21 Sustainable Development are um, you know on the other end of the political spectrum for me. But uh, I do want to say that it, through, I'm sure, the pressure from the Tea Party, um, the uh, Republican National Committee and the Republican platform now includes a plank saying that uh, they repudiate Agenda 21 but and ICLEI. But uh, in fact, you know, at the top, uh, there's no power has no party. And uh, so what we're, you know, obviously what they're saying, they're naming Agenda 21. And then they're hoping that you're not going to recognize that it doesn't come called Agenda 21 when it shows up in your town. It's scenic byways, it's redevelopment, it's uh, form-based codes, you know, uh, um, smart meters, water metering, all, you know, everything, uh, it's just about everything is Agenda 21 now. Your educational system being, uh, you know, messed with uh, through uh, um outcome-based education. But um, we do have a lot of people who are becoming aware more and more all the time. My my book is going all over the world. It's incredible how many people are uh, becoming aware of this now. So in Alabama, in in the United States, in Alabama, uh, Senate Bill 477 was passed uh, just a couple of months ago, a few months ago, that says that no infringement can be made on private property rights and that uh, Agenda 21, ICLEI, cannot be funded there in Alabama. And what that looks like then is a rejection of regional plans. And so that happened in Baldwin County, Alabama, just uh, in August. The county commissioners rejected their comprehensive plan, Horizon 2025. They said that it violated private property rights. And uh, this is happening with refusal to um, to take federal money for sustainable community strategy grants, and that happened in Gaston County, North Carolina. They refused to uh, to participate in Connect Our Future. That's 14 counties, a five million dollar grant that they were getting from um, the feds, EPA, DOT, and uh, HUD. And also that happened all again in Rochester, New Hampshire, back this past month. They refused to participate in something called Granite State Future, also a regional plan. So uh, you'll find that cities like uh, Corte Madera, California, are getting out of their councils of government and refusing to participate in these regional plans. Well, it is important, once again, to stress that people are fighting back and they are having that effect. Unfortunately, we are completely out of time, Rosa, so we're going to have to leave it there. But just tell us once again what your website address is for people who want to find out more about this. Yes, please come and visit us at Democrats Against UN Agenda 21.com and Post Sustainability Institute.org. Well, time flies when you're having fun and also when you're documenting very serious issues. So, uh, Rosa Corey, thank you for your time tonight, and I hope we can talk to you again in the future. Thank you so much, James. Had a great time. All right, that's going to do it for tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, I will be back tomorrow night here on the program. Same time, same channel. So be there or be square. And until then, thank you for listening and take care.